So my name is Jan Lucky. I'm the Transportation Planning Manager for Washington County. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's great to see some familiar faces and uh, some new faces too. Um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of um, our format tonight. And then I'll be uh, turning it over to my colleagues. Uh, and um, you may have read this on the invitation, but the first first part of the meeting is going to be a 30-minute uh, information presentation. We're going to be um, sharing with you a lot of data, a lot of detail, um, information that you've requested. And uh, we're asking, though, that you allow us to kind of get through that presentation and hold questions. We were going to break into small groups, but since this is a pretty uh, reasonable size group, we think that we can proceed having every, giving everyone an opportunity to ask questions um, all together. If you have concerns about that, let us know. The main reason we were breaking into small groups is because we got really positive feedback about that when we did the neighborhood meetings, that groups of 10 to 15 made it easier for everyone to get their questions asked and answered um, and so we think we can manage that with this size but let us know if you feel differently um, and we also you may have um, gleaned this we are videotaping and recording um, the presentation and uh, the small group if we all stay in this room and we'll be making that available on the gateway corridor website so if you have neighbors or friends that weren't able to make it tonight or to the next session that starts at 6 30 um, there'll be an opportunity for that too so I'm just going to write a little background about how we got to tonight. Um, we held neighborhood meetings in Oakdale, all residents south of 10th Street, in uh, December and January. Um, could you raise your hand if you were at one of those neighborhood meetings, just so we get a sense of who was there? Okay, so about two thirds of you. That that helps. And um, at that at those neighborhood meetings, um, there were definitely themes of questions that were starting to emerge. Um, we heard a lot of the same questions at each of the of the neighborhood meetings, and so we had proposed to the group at that time um, getting back together for topic based nights, um, and that's uh, kind of how we're proceeding. There are three general topic areas that uh, I were identified from that those neighborhood meetings and environment, which is tonight, and we'll be talking about air, noise, water, um, ridership, which I don't have the date in front of me, but it's in about two weeks, right, Lissa? March 9th. March 9th. And, um, and then engineering details or the um, various alignments that we're studying, and that date has yet to be determined because we're taking your feedback and we're still looking at different alignments um, that we should be studying. So uh, does anyone have any questions about how we got to tonight or the process or the format that I could answer? Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Lissa Leitner. Okay, Lissa. Thank you, Jan. Um, I know a lot of you in the room, but for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Lissa Leitner. I also work for Washington County with Jan, and I am the project manager for the Gateway Corridor Project. What I want to talk a little bit about, and then I'm going to turn it over to our environmental experts, is how we got to the pieces that we wanted to talk about today that we're focusing on for this topic, environment. As Jan mentioned, when we had those 10 neighborhood level meetings, we got a lot of questions and concerned about kind of three, what we'd call environmental topics, uh, which is air, water, and noise. So water being floodplains, groundwater, or sorry, you know, wetlands, I should say, lakes, uh, and any sort of stormwater runoff. Um, and then noise is that third one. What we want to do today is talk to you about the preliminary results for the environmental analysis based on all of the work that's been done to date. Everything is preliminary, and it is preliminary because we have done some of that analysis, but that analysis has not been vetted in a legal fashion by any of our participating agencies, and we'll get into all of the groups that will have the opportunity to kind of vet and approve all that information um, and discuss how that process happens. One thing I wanted to touch on a little bit further, and I will expand on this route and what bus rapid transit in just a little bit, because I know there might be some folks that are a little bit less familiar, is that the map here shows the route and the alternatives that were under consideration up to about, um, until about January. Um, in January, the city of Lake Elmo decided they no longer wanted to participate in this project, and their city council voted against it. 
Um, from that time, we now are working with all of our partners, including the city of Oakdale, Washington County, and the remainder of the cities, there's five cities, Ramsey County, MnDOT, Metropolitan Council, a lot of our other agency partners are still committed to finding a transit solution for this project. But we will be looking at alternative routes or different routes starting in Oakdale and going into Woodbury. And so we wanted to put this map up here just as a reminder of all the things we did look at. And so we know a lot of you folks live along 4th Street in this area. So all the results today are based on these routes. And so the results potentially could change, but what doesn't change is how we collect those results, which is called the methodology. How we do all of that data collection and how we report on that will not change. That stays the same no matter where we are running a project. So as a reminder, this project starts in downtown St. Paul. It is bus rapid transit, which is very similar to light rail transit. It has a dedicated lane in each direction. Um, it is buses, it is not trains. A dedicated bus lane, one in each direction, that is added basically for the most part between I-94 and the frontage road, all the way through the St. Paul section. Um, we are not in 94. We are not taking away a lane from I-94. We are not taking lanes away from existing roadways. We are adding two additional lanes for buses, one in each direction. All of these dots along the way in the text are stops along the way. From end to end, it's about a 37 minute trip. So from about Manning Avenue, no matter what route you take, all the way into Union Depot is about a 37 minute trip. Um, you can have the opportunity, say, to get on for example, at Earl Street, if you were a resident at Earl Street and you worked at 3M and get off there. Or another example is if you took the express bus from Guardian Angels Church, which exists today and got your job in downtown Minneapolis, this is an opportunity for you to be able to get back to your car in the middle of the day or say after a Saints game if you wanted to do entertainment activities, which, you, which isn't an option today. So it's working with the current system and providing other options. But it's adding two new uh, bus lane in each direction, but is not taking away an existing lane from any existing streets or the freeway. This next map is just what we are going to be using going forward. So all the other maps and we will reference where the route used to run along 4th Street. And we, we are not saying that we are absolutely not running on 4th Street. What we are saying is that all of this, everything basically in this box is up for reevaluation. And so this is a great opportunity um, to be able for you all to have additional input on what these routes are. More information will be coming forward probably in the spring summertime. So we will come back and make sure that's communicated to you about how you can have um, direct input on those decisions on the routes. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeannie Witzig, who is one of our environmental experts, and they will get into the rest of the presentation. So I want to just step back and talk a little bit about why we're doing what's called the Straft Environmental Impact Statement. Um, Lissa mentioned various local agencies that are participating in the project. At the federal level, the Federal Transit Administration um, is the federal agency that uh, we are partnering with for this project. They also um, could be a funding partner through what's called the New Starts process. It's a competitive process nationally for transit projects across the country. So because of um, the potential for federal dollars, um, the FTA is involved, and we prepare a federal environmental document under the National Environmental Policy Act. We also have very stringent state um, review requirements um, in the environmental world um, under the Minnesota Environmental Policy Act. So it's a joint federal state environmental document. The document is really um, to present what the findings are of the technical analysis, as well as summarize the decision-making process for the project. It really is to um, put in a document format the overall process that's been happening throughout um, this project, starting with the alternatives analysis. 
There are various elements to the um, draft environmental impact statement. This is a pretty substantial document. It typically, they're a couple hundred pages with a lot of supporting technical um, reports uh, to reference, and that information is summarized in the environmental document. The uh, first element of the, the document is defining the purpose and need, and that's really why is the project being um, studied. What are the goals and objectives, and then what are the evaluating criteria for the various alternatives that we'll be evaluating? Again, then clearly defining what alternatives um, are going through detailed evaluation. Um, that will be that's a pretty substantial chapter within the environmental document. The really the the meat of it is the impact analysis, and there are. Um, numerous issue areas or impact areas that we study in the draft environmental impact statement. It's not just natural resource elements that are studied, um, but rather uh, social elements, community elements, um, impacts and benefits, as well as transportation. We also identify the financial um, component for the project and also trying to capture um, if there are other projects in the area, making sure that we adequately assess how those projects impact the Gateway Corridor and vice versa. This document also will summarize the various public outreach efforts and um, other agency coordination um, activities that have happened throughout the project. And as Jessica goes into some more of the detail of each of the issue areas, we'll reference the federal and state, regional and local agencies that we work with when we do the technical analysis and that are a part of the technical review. So just to kind of recap, the draft EIS, it builds off of the alternatives analysis process that preceded the draft EIS that looked at a much longer corridor, looked at a variety of transit modes. So it's building off, that's, that is primarily our foundation for what we started with. Um, the draft EIS process started back in 2013. Um, <clears throat> the first stage of that was the scoping process. And the figure that Lissa showed of the various alternatives that initially were evaluated came out of that scoping process. It was a very formal process. One of the areas, too, that the draft EIS um, works to start to identify are what we call mitigation measures, where there are impact areas in each of the um, issue areas. We identify some of those preliminary ways that those impacts could be avoided, minimized, or mitigated. And that is further defined as the project advances into a final EIS. In the federal environmental review process, there's the draft EIS, there is then a public um, review and comment period, and then there is the final EIS. The final decision then in the environmental review process is what, what's called a record of decision. A couple other elements um, that are good to know relative to the draft EIS. We start at about 1% um, engineering as we do the technical analysis. That's a pretty um, industry standard. It's enough for us to understand what that footprint is for the project, um, what the right-of-way boundaries would be that we need to study. Um, and it gives us enough information so we can do, say, capital cost estimates, um, doing some operating estimates, um, and, and really starting to lay out what the impacts and the benefits are for the project. At this stage in the process, um, since we're at kind of that lower level of engineering, we, we typically assume worst case so that we can start from a broader or higher level of impact and as the project advances in engineering and those impacts typically are reduced. This graphic really shows there are multiple stages within a project um, like the Gateway Corridor. Um, and as the project advances, the engineering advances, and with that, um, the certainty of impacts or the certainty on cost um, increases. 
um, as the as the engineering um, is in higher level of detail. That can be related to cost, but it can also be related to um, as we define the impacts, they become much more refined as the project advances um, from the draft EIS stage all the way through to construction. So it's it's just a it's a it's a snapshot to show we're at the very initial stages of of that project um, definition, and it's it's a long process. So with that. Jessica will start to talk through the various technical areas. I'm getting into the methodology and our preliminary findings. Hi, my name is Jessica Lobbs. I'm with the consultant team and I've been working behind the scenes with all the different technical leads uh, on the environmental impact statement. So I have the pleasure of talking to you about some details tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with air quality and move on to noise and then some of the water resources. And just so you kind of know how I'm gonna walk through this, I'll provide a, a bunch of details, but then at the end, summarize the findings that we have current as of today um, in a final slide of just a couple of bullets. So those couple of bullets are your takeaways. So starting out with air quality, in all of these you'll see a pattern that we have a lot of regulations that we need to follow. We're concerned with any changes to traffic volumes or traffic patterns, um, changes in roadway locations. All of these are things as part of the project that could affect air quality. So that's why we, why we look at it. Oops. <clears throat> air quality is governed by the Environmental Protection Agency. That's the main federal agency that sets the standards for air quality. And when we're doing analysis, we look at two different types of pollutants, basically criteria pollutants um, are common things that are transportation related that the EPA monitors. Uh, things like ozone or carbon monoxide, lead, that kind of thing. Uh, we also look at what's, what are called mobile source air toxics or basically emissions. So what is coming out of the, the tailpipe of vehicles. So we compare all of these to standards that are set by the EPA. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two subjects. Criteria pollutants, um, the EPA designates geographic areas based on the concentrations of these different pollutants. So we talk about areas that are in attainment or non-attainment. If an area is a non-attainment area, that means it, f it is above the standards for those pollutants that are set by the federal government. If it is an attainment area, it falls below those thresholds. So we look, take a look at that whole list of pollutants and figure out for which the Twin Cities as a metro area are in attainment or non-attainment. For all of those, uh, we are in attainment area except for carbon monoxide or CO. Um, in that, we're in that yellow area called maintenance which means previously the Twin Cities was categorized as a non-attainment area. It exceeded federal thresholds for carbon monoxide. In, I believe it was the year two, in the 2000s, it switched to an attainment area, but the government, uh, the EPA, if you make a switch like that, they wanna keep monitoring the situation. So that's why it's called a maintenance area and there are different higher levels of analysis that we need to do. So we're gonna focus on that carbon monoxide analysis. To do that, we look at specific intersections or hot spots. We looked at five intersections with the highest traffic volumes and also the poorest level of service. So the intersections in the project area that had the most cars going through it and the most cars sitting and waiting. So if you take a look at some different levels of carbon monoxide um, and the modeling that we did. This first column, I don't know if you can see my little red dot here, um, is the background concentration. So for air quality, we look at an, an opening year situation. So if, the, if Gateway opens in 2022, if Gateway were, were not there, if there was no BRT system, our levels would be about 3.0 and 1.4 for an eight hour average. If you look at it with BRT, there is a slight increase 
in concentrations. But if you look at this regulatory standard column, all in all, with or without BRT, we are well below federal thresholds for any kind of air quality concerns. The second thing we look at in an air quality analysis are those emissions, or what they call MSATs. So one thing we wanted to point out here is that if we look at traffic levels with the BRT system or without, in the future year of 2040, those traffic levels are pretty much the same. There's not a lot of change. Um, another thing that's important to point out for MSAT analysis or this emissions analysis is that we're doing a great job as a country reducing our emissions. We have better and efficient, more efficient cars and some stricter regulations that are going in place. So all in all, that equals out to not a lot of issues for those emissions. So we don't anticipate those for Gateway either. So in summary, we have been consulting a lot with FTA as the federal agency running this project, with the Highway Administration, because we're so close to 94, the Pollution Control Agency, which governs air quality at a state level, and also MnDOT. So we do not expect, um, as a preliminary finding, that we are going to exceed any, state, any federal standards uh, for any of these air quality pollutants. Moving on to noise. Noise is also regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency and also the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, MnDOT also gets involved in noise analysis for, analysis for transportation projects. So FTA has its own set of guidance for noise. And we start the first step identifying noise sensitive land uses within about 300 feet of any alignments we're studying. And so what is a noise sensitive land use? There are three categories that are considered in the analysis. Uh, category one is land where quiet is very uh, a big part of the intended purpose. And that would be something like um, a park with a historic element where pass more passive recreation is important, quiet is important, um, an outdoor amphitheater where it's important to not have a lot of competing noise. A category two are residences and buildings where people normally sleep. So your homes, apartment buildings, hotels, hospitals. And category three are the institutional land uses that have primarily daytime and evening use. Uh, so libraries, schools, that sort of thing. In the corridor, you have many of these types of uses, obviously, single family residences, apartments, hotels, churches, and schools, all in the Oakdale portion of the corridor. And this figure here on the side just illustrates what that about 300 feet on either side of an alignment would look like. We then take a look at what the existing noise levels are. And that's important in this corridor and in this. Uh, for the project because obviously we're right next to Interstate 94 and the noise levels are pretty high as it is. Um, so we want to understand what our baseline is that we're working from. So we looked at or measured noise at three different locations in Oakdale. And you see them here, the yellow dots. This is the American property hotel and then two residential properties. And these locations are selected based on, <coughs> excuse me, they're chosen as representative locations um, that can represent a neighborhood and are reflective of the general noise environment. And there we measure one hour and 24 hour noise levels. The third step is to pr predict the project noise levels from the actual BRT operations. So what we would anticipate the noise levels would be as a result of the bus. We do that based on preliminary engineering plans, based on what we know about how fast the bus will be going, how many times it will come in and out of a station, and what hours it will operate. And it's important to note here that project noise that we measure is the noise coming exclusively from the bus. So the new thing that we're introducing into the noise environment, which is the BRT vehicles 
and its operations. As a fourth step, we look at what the impact zones are. And so we bring everything together, the existing noise, those sensitive land uses, and we take a look at at what distance do we need to be to experience an impact. So there are, once again, calculated levels of moderate or severe impact. We want to know at what point we're reaching those thresholds or if we will reach those thresholds. So, and then once we've <clears throat> established those impact zones, we take a look at where those noise sensitive properties are and do they fall within those impact zones. All together here, because I know that's a lot of steps. So these are some of the different project segments in the city of Oakdale. We're going to take a look at this line here, which is the area between 694 and Ideal. So for example, kind of bringing this all together, we measured the existing noise. So if you were standing in the roadway, um, there is an existing noise level of about 66 decibels. If you were standing about 50 feet away and the bus goes by, you're experiencing a noise level of about 50 decibels. This impact criteria set um, within the FTA guidance says that we need to be at a level of 61 decibels to have a moderate impact and 67 for a severe impact. So that's, that's one way to represent, you know, the project levels are below those impact criteria. The second step we take in this is, okay, well, how close do we have to be to experience an impact? So this column here tells us that in this area, we have to be standing within 15 feet of the bus to experience a moderate noise impact, something that's perceptible. And then we take it one step further and we look, okay, where's the nearest sensitive land use? And in this portion, the nearest home or church or whatever it may be is 120 feet away from the source of the noise, from the bus, which brings us to that there would be no noise impact. So we apply that logic and that analysis as prescribed by the guidance from FTA and the other regulatory agencies um, to evaluate noise in the corridor. So in summary, very, we've had a lot of conversations about noise with FTA, with FHWA, because we're so close to a highway facility and the Pollution Control Agency, as well as MnDOT. So on a preliminary findings, no noise impacts anticipated to those noise sensitive land use. That has a lot to do with the existing noise levels on I-84 and then the fact that there is pretty limited noise coming from actual BRT vehicles. And again, those sensitive land uses you see listed there. Surface waters, last one. Surface waters include all wetlands, lakes, streams, um, ditches and drainage ways. So we take a look at everything. An impact to one of those water bodies would be filling part of it with dirt or otherwise physically disturbing it. And again, um, a series of regulations at the federal, state and local level that govern water bodies. Wetlands, you see here, we look at quite a broad area that's represented by this black dotted line. And all these numbers with little leaders represent wetlands. So we took a broad look at all the wetlands in the project area. Um, you'll remember one of the alignments came down 4th Street. We had a couple of different options for where the bus might be in the middle on the side. So we looked at what impacts there might be to wetlands. And most would occur just in this area here and would be either the north side or the south side, depending on which option. And then we have a small uh, stream impact here, which is kind of an unnamed outlet to Wilmis, I think that's how you say it, Lake. Um, again, a very limited stretch of impact. Touchy. So wetland impacts in Oakdale and 
for the project as a whole are very minimal. Um, in Oakdale, these are the different wetlands where we would have impacts that were represented on those maps. In total, in Oakdale, we have anywhere from zero to 0.29 acre. So a third of an acre would be the most wetland impact we would have in Oakdale. As a total for the project, it's a pretty small number overall, about one acre or less for the entire project. We will need to mitigate. We do have an impact. So we have been working closely with the Arm US Army Corps of Engineers throughout the process on our methodology on how we identify impacts. Um, we will, they will require a permit and as the, the Department of Natural Resources will as well. Um, I will note that the level of wetland impact for the corridor is, requires the lowest level of permit that the Corps has. Impacts thus far have been avoided and minimized as much as we can at this level of design. And right now, per current regulations, the replacement, the replacement ratio for wetland, wetlands would be 2.5 to 1. So more wetlands would be returned than are actually being impacted. That would occur through a physical improvement or addition of wetlands or purchase of uh, credits from a state-managed wetland bank. And that decision will be made as we understand more about the final um, design of the project and in close coordination with the different agencies. Floodplains were an issue. Oh, I wanna also, I know in, in the previous meetings, wildlife concerns also came up. If there are wetland impacts, what does that mean for some of the wildlife uh, in the area and I just wanted to mention that the DEIS does have a full section on impacts to wildlife, habitat quality, and uh, threatened and endangered species. So that's definitely something that we are covering. Flood floodplain impact is very similar to wetland impact. Are we adding anything to a floodplain? Uh, that would result in a loss of storage area for water to go and I know there have been some concerns in this area in Oakdale about water, where does water go, how is it stored, floodplain impacts. Heavily regulated once again. Um, we have one area that's associated with that same wetland. So there would be a floodplain impact here. And that's about 400 cubic yards of fill, again would be closely coordinated and mitigation would be required to replace that storage. Um, we did take a close look at some of the areas that were mentioned in some of the previous meetings and those are outside of the area of impact for the project. We also got all the FEMA documentation, the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, from the city on some recent changes that have been made to floodplains in the area and reviewed all that and made sure we still fell within, this, within these numbers. Stormwater, I'll touch on real quickly. Um, this is an ongoing effort. Um, because we are so close to I-94, we have to work very closely with MnDOT on what we're gonna do with stormwater. So we'll be looking at how much impervious or non, you know, not grass, how much concrete or asphalt are we adding to the project and what does that mean for how the stormwater behaves and moves. And we also consider where the water goes and how it affects other water bodies. So if there are impaired lakes or streams in the corridor that we would be um, putting water into, we wanna know what those impacts would be as well. So again, that's something we'll be closely coordinating with all the agencies, including the local watershed districts and the cities. So we've been consulting with a number of agencies uh, the Corps of Engineers is a cooperating agency, which means they have a pretty high level of involvement in reviewing all of our tech reports. And we've met with them several times. Um, they have to give us approvals for what we're doing. Overall, so far, minimal impacts to wetlands and floodplains and stormwater impacts will be determined. So you, Jan.
So that concludes the 30-minute the presentation that we had prepared. And we know that was a lot of information <laughs> to share with you. And we anticipate um, that you have questions. And so we, um, I think we'll, as we mentioned, keep the group together because um, this is a small enough group. We think everyone will be able to have a chance to get their questions asked. And all we ask is so that we can continue um, recording, videotaping and audio recording. If you wouldn't mind coming to the microphone to um, ask your question, that's the only way the, the camera guy can, uh, can pick it up. So at this time, um, we'll just ask you to raise your hand and... Um, Pose your question, it can, and, and different members of the project team will likely participate in uh, in answering. So, does anyone have a question to kick us off? You're going to make me stand here <laughs> and smile. I have one question. Great. Would you mind coming up and asking it? I know that's a little bit awkward. It's just the best way to capture it. And in fact, I can just turn it around. Nobody else said anything yet. I just wondered. Oh, dear. Well, at one time, I was at a meeting, and I heard someone say, we have to use Mr. Ryan's property. Does anybody know what property along 4th Street is Mr. Ryan's? And then another thing I heard was, we need to use that intersection. Now, I don't know what intersection they were talking about, but those were two things I heard that made me wonder was what land along Forest Street is Mr. Ryan's that they have to use? I live on the corner of Forth and Helmo, where there's going to be a, a uh, platform. The, I will address the second question first, and I'll make sure I record that as well. Um, what I would have to assume the comment was about was about traffic signals, so a new stoplight. Um, one of the, when we get to the conversation about what the routes will be, oh, the... <laughs> when we get to the, so that third topic conversation, We'll talk about more specifically the routes and how the engineering happened because that was a big piece of the conversation we heard is how this will actually work on 4th Street. But we didn't want to bring that level of detailed information to you since it might all change. Um, but I'm assuming that's what the comment was about is where there would have to be a traffic signal. Um, but I don't want to comment specifically on what intersections those are at. Um, but they get selected to make sure all of the traffic throughout the whole area functions but those are the sorts of things that we can get into in that in that third meeting um, based on what the routes or potential new routes look like and then for your first question I will be honest um, I have been involved in this project since 2010 and I have absolutely zero knowledge of a property owned by a Mr. Ryan and I'm not sure who told you that there's obviously other people involved in this project um, we can do a Washington County search on who the taxpayers are for each, every single property. And so we can look into that. But to my knowledge, there is no parcel of land along this entire corridor that we are trying to use because of a certain property owner. Are there any other questions or comments that folks have? And if there aren't any in a formal setting like this, we have until um, about 6 o'clock until this meeting is over. And so our staff can all, um, we have multiple environmental experts. Um, Rachel here is one as well in the green sweater if you want to wave. Um, and Jan and I, and we can answer questions offline or we can um, make those recorded as well. Um, if, if that works. But if there are other questions, we would be happy to have you come up and, and speak about them right now. Oh. <coughs> um, mine was just on the floodplains. Okay, if you want to come up, sorry. This is a little... Trying to figure out what you're talking here. 
Mine is just on the floodplains. About the dashes on here. I mean, what? Maybe we can um, go to flip to the map. Yeah. Near the end. There we go. It's a touchy. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So does that mean parts of this is getting cut off? No, filled the, in? The, the dash lines. Yep. I'm Right. <laughs> Sorry. The dash lines, that, that represents the area of, that we studied. So within each um, impact area we studied, our kind of the area differed depending on the type of resource. And for when we study water resource impacts, that area that we look at in terms of what, what could be impacted is much broader. And so those dash lines represent kind of the broad area that we looked at to see where are the floodplains within that dash line. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not far <coughs> from Greenway. I'm Greystone, and we're Greystone and First. So I was just kind of wondering if it's meaning anything is getting filled in in those areas. No, no, it's um, the, the areas where there were impact, where there would be impacts, very limited um, to just off of 4th Street, okay. that the impact areas on the figure um, would be represented by that yellow area. So uh, the dash line looks at how big an area did we study, mm -hmm. and then the impact area is the yellow line. Okay. Thank yep. you. So You're welcome. Inside the dashed area or just inside? inside. I mean, where, where, just where Greenway is, mm -hmm. you go down Greenway. If you turn on first, you come to ours on Greystone at the end. And I mean, we're just not very far from the frontage road also. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> thank you. I'm also concerned about that floodplain area. Uh, we have some of the townhomes that uh, right now are having to buy flood insurance because of that area. Now the city of Oakdale allowed those homes on 4th Street to be built there. With this whole project, will they be putting up a wall or something there to make sure that these homes are not going to be in a floodplain? Mm -hmm. Oh, right, Jessica, the, the, the specific information from the city um, when the floodplain uh, boundaries were modified, there's a very formal process that the um, Federal Emergency Management Association and, and, uh, Agency requires. Um, so we did look at um, how those changes would affect our impact analysis, and the conclusion was that they, they would not. They would not do anything to help these people to not be more in the floodplain. Is that what I'm understanding? What we look at is um, from our from the project's perspective, we look at is will the project impact the floodplains? So we look at the the impact for this project specifically. Um, I, I can't speak directly to the impacts associated with the with the current homes. And Jessica, do you have anything more on? <clears throat> just that, um, yeah, so the impact from this project would be just that green area, and that would be mitigated within the same floodplain area if we need to create more storage. Um, again, can't speak to the, the current issues and what's causing them uh, or what the city might be doing about that, but any changes to the floodplain or which results maybe in people now being in the floodplain when they weren't before. Um, we reviewed all that documentation and have incorporated that into our analysis, but it didn't change anything from the impacts that Gateway would cause to the floodplain. So any floodplain the project impacts, we have to mitigate for that. And so that the only area within Oakdale is near that area where people were buying their homeowner insurance. Uh -huh. The process that was done with the city of Oakdale, the very formal process, didn't change any of our analysis, but 
there is still a sl small impact and we would have to mitigate for that. Maybe it would be helpful if we <laughs> talked about what the word mitigate means and the types of things that you do when you say, when we mitigate, you know, what does that mean? So basically, if, if we are removing, or if we are, if we are placing dirt in the, fill pl in the floodplain, <coughs> we're taking away some of that storage where water goes. So if there's a flood event, so we have to replace that. We have to provide extra storage in the same floodplain area so that water has somewhere to go. So, so you so dig the hole deeper or what? That would be one way or create a larger area. We look at the whole system and downstream impacts and all of that, and that's closely coordinated with the watershed and the DNR on what that mitigation needs to be what we need to do to make sure that that storage is still there. Because at this point, I don't know how you'd even get equipment down in there to dig it deeper. And there's, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, right, right. And right. that's, those kinds of details are as the engineering advances, as the, there's more definition to the project, what's going to make the most sense, what's going to have the least impact in other areas, you know, we, we don't want to replace one type of impact with another type of impact. So they, they really look at the kind of the watershed area and where is it going to make the most sense and where will be the greatest benefit for that mitigation to occur. I guess it still doesn't make sense to me, but <coughs> that's okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I live <coughs> I live on Holly Lane and you have given us <coughs> a preliminary noise result on Hadley Avenue 694 Ideal Avenue will you give us one on the 4th Street will sure. that be looked at sure I can if we can great I can start this out. Um, the, what we reference here are the, the segments that we looked at. And so from the 694 to ideal, that reflects the alignment on 4th Street. So it's, it's the two endpoints, the west endpoint and the east endpoint. And that reflects having the BRT on 4th Street is what our analysis did. So the existing noise that we reference up there um, reflects the noise on 4th Street, the current conditions. That those are the exist. That's the existing noise level. And that, that's actually really good feedback. We can update. Yes, this I think that so there's clarity that on this that. This is 4th Street yep. between 694 and Ideal. Yep. That's not very clear. Yep. So we appreciate Thank that. You. We will we do that better. Be better um, yep. To communicate. Other questions? Come on up, Linda. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just don't understand about the noise, uh, not the noise, the um, air quality. It said that the whole area was an attainment area, which I think means it's under the EPA standards, but then where you said the criteria pollutants, it said it would only go, it would go up like 0.2, but that it didn't go above the EPA standards, so that seemed kind of contradictory to me. It seemed like the air quality was going to get a little bit worse, but it um, was stated in a way to make it sound like it didn't go against the regulations, so I'm, I'd like a better explanation of that. Yeah, let's, let's spend some more time on that. We'll, that. we'll bring Jessica back up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me pull that up real quick. Mm -hmm. So, and we do have an air and noise expert in the room in John Crawford. So, John, please help me out if I'm saying something out of turn. Um, so, when we talk about the attainment areas, you want to pull yeah. that up? Yeah, the, the slide with the, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the chart. The red, right. 
So this is a geographic um, designation or a designation based on geography that the EPA designates. So, so you're right that if we are in, so for carbon monoxide or CO, we were once in non-attainment. So we, um, we didn't meet the standards. Um, or another way to say that, right, we as the Twin Cities region. Um, so one way you could also think about that is those pollutants were above the levels that the EPA says is okay. So I might have said that in not a clear way before. Um, so now they're saying we are, as the Twin Cities, in attainment. So we are below those threshold levels as a region. But then we apply that at a project level, which is that other table. Yep. So you're right, in 2022, it shows that 3.0 is a one hour average. Uh, with the project, it would go up just a tiny bit. Um, but this regulatory standard here of 35, that's sort of that level that the EPA says, you can't be above this for carbon monoxide specifically. So we're well below that. Um, so if we were above that 35, that would be considered an air quality impact. Does that help? We looked at all of the others, um, but all of the others were within an attainment area or considered uh, as a region, we're in attainment for those other pollutants. We did do an assessment of those to make sure that what we were adding as part of the project would not exceed any thresholds. But because we're in the maintenance area for carbon monoxide, that required a little bit more analysis um, as dictated by the EPA. So we, we did that additional hotspot intersection analysis just to make sure that Right. Yes. Well, actually, Linda, I think that's also great feedback on the presentation. So this is our first time, right. and we can update your questions. Will help us update the slides to make it more clear. Okay. So, because if 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 it's you know not clear to you, that it's definitely not clear to others too. So thank okay. you. I think another point that I don't know if we emphasize this or not, and it was early on in the slides, but um, the net the, then. Um, Draft environmental impact statement is looking at worst case scenarios. So that's assuming mm -hmm. that we're running diesel buses in the bus rapid transit corridor. And as many of you probably know, you know, technology is changing rapidly and there are hybrid buses, there are electric buses that are now available. And those would have less impact than what we're showing because um, we're looking at worst case scenario. So if the type of bus that would be used for the Gateway Corridor project, you know, if that's important to you, that's another type of comment that you could make now or during you know, the comment period for the draft environmental impact statement. Um, because there are you know, various bus technologies that are available and much further in the process you know, down the road is when we would look at actually purchasing the buses. And if that's important to you, then we, you, we would welcome your feedback on that. This is looking at impacts related to, well, for more or less, the types and mixes right. that this, Jessica can actually better explain this okay. than, uh, than I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, other questions? Well, oh, great, come on up. I have another question. <clears throat> at one of the other meetings that I was at, <clears throat> they talked about the bridge on the east of 4th Street. Uh, has, has that, has anything more been talked about that? The, one the bridge that crosses over the interstate. Are you, are you looking for a specific question about the impact? I'm sorry, what the impact to the bridge would be, or? Well, the meetings that I were at, 
they talked about how the bridge is not wide enough now mm -hmm. and what would be done with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that came up at some of the meetings that I attended as well. So. Um, the, pro the, propo the project would propose potentially that we'd be running in mixed traffic over the bridge. Um, the meeting I was at, we talked about even the current bridge without bus rapid transit. Um, it's difficult to walk across and bike across. There's no shoulder, there's no room. You're, you're pretty much balancing on the curb. And so um, the meeting that I attended, which was the ninth and 10th meeting that we had, um, we were on the west side of 694 for those neighborhoods and uh, we talked about whether um, there could be um, a separate sort of bike and pedestrian bridge you know for for walking and biking only that could be constructed alongside the existing bridge and regardless of the gateway project based on that meeting and that feedback we at the county have started talking about that um, and with the city about whether that's something the, ki the city and the county could partner on even if we don't build this because it was very clear at that meeting that um, it's to walk or bike across and everyone's nodding you know concurrent with that um, and so but the actual bus rapid transit this project here would be running in mixed traffic across the bridge um, with the vehicles good question other questions Sir, you look like you're about to say something, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so, a gentleman in the audience asked, how far does mixed traffic, how, how far would the buses run in mixed traffic as they approach the bridge and, and exit the bridge? Uh, maybe I'll turn that over to um, Jeannie. Sure. Do we, um, do you want me to? <laughs> yep, okay, that sounds good. I just feel like I'm at a skew. Um, the, essentially, it would, it would, yeah, be running in that mixed traffic as it comes off of Hadley and crosses the bridge and then would transition. What we've looked at to date um, would be either running on the south side of 4th Street uh, or running in the middle of 4th Street. So it would be essentially right coming off of the bridge, then it would, would transition into dedicated guideway. Are there other questions related to the, the bridge? Okay, any other questions in general? Okay, well we are here until um, the next group is arriving at 6.30. So I realize it's, it's maybe uncomfortable to come to the mic. I certainly find it uncomfortable. And so uh, we um, will stay here in this room. And those of you that have questions that you want answered one-on-one, -on -one, um, you can approach me. Any of the project team members will be here for another hour and a half before the next group comes. And if you'd like to stay for the next group and hear it twice, we would welcome your continued participation. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for coming out. We know this is a lot of time. And you know, we know you're really busy. And there's a handout that you should have picked up when you um, entered Ways to Engage in the Gateway Project. It has our website. It has information to sign up for our e-news. You can sign up at the table if that's something that you'd like to do tonight. And um, there's lots of ways to um, engage with us. Phone, um, you can call Lisa, you can call me. Uh, we want to be available to you. So um, thanks again for coming. And we will hopefully see you on, hold on. March 9th. We'll get to the very look. Oh. Like it is a lot of slides. It's at the end here. Oops. There. Um, the ridership meeting. So on March 9th, same location, we'll be um, discussing ridership and then uh, watch for another invitation in the mail about the date for the engineering details, which is really what I mean by that are the alignments that we're studying. And I just want to clarify, ridership, there's a lot of questions in that first round about who will be riding this, where are people coming from, how do you figure out um, the numbers of people that will be getting on and off each station and the project as a whole. So all of that sort of technical analysis is what we mean by ridership. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right.